Good day. It's Professor Resnick again. I want to, to uh, uh, extend what we have done heretofore to uh, something the Marxian tradition has been very interested in, which is that of uh, colonialism um, and imperialism um, or the world economy. It's something that Marx intended to do, and unfortunately he, he died before he could write his uh, work on this, but this is something that he mentioned in the Critique of Political Economy, which, where he outlined what he intended to do. This was a book that he was going to write on, if I remember correctly, he said the world economy. Um, that is to extend the value and the surplus value analysis uh, that we have discussed in this course to international trade and international capital flow. So I just want to to, to begin a little bit of that, since um, um, I think I find it interesting, and I hope you will um, as well. So let me go back to something that we recently discussed. Um, and it, it, the numbers are exactly the same. Everything is the same, except I'm just going to change who is competing. So on the blackboard, and it would also be a, a nice uh, review for us. On the blackboard, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to put this table that we have discussed. Over here, I'm going to put um, Britain, Germany, and uh, France. So in this column over here, we have different national capitals competing with one another. That is, British capitalists are competing with German capitalists, are competing with French capitalists. So I'm assuming that all the capitalists in Britain are the same, which is not accurate, but I'm going to assume that. They're all the same in Germany, they're all the same in France, but they differ across these different nations. Okay, so reading this way, this would be the nations, that is the capitalists in these different nations. And I'm going to talk about the particular industry um, that people were uh, uh, analyzing at the time of of, of Marx, which is the textile industry. So this is the textile industry, or the cotton cloth industry, textile and cotton cloth. That was kind of the high-tech industry of the day <coughs> after the 1850s. So I want to go textile industry, you know, roughly 1850s to the war, World War I, 1914, 1850 to 1914, so that period of time, okay? And I want to talk about over here, of course, the value flows, the C, the V, the S, the W. Okay, so I hope that this is clear what this is. And what I'm going to assume here is that we have a world market. So we have been talking here before about national market, now I want to extend this to a world market. World market in what? In cotton cloth, in cotton shirts. Okay? So these national cap capitals are competing in an international or a world market. And let's have our same numbers because it's easier to deal with. Number of shirts. One, 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 okay? Let's put everything down here. Composition of capital is uh, uh, four over six, two thirds, two thirds, two thirds. And the price is 24 divided by three, so the price of a shirt on the international market is eight, eight pounds, whatever the case may be, okay? Let's do one more. Rate of profit here, um, two over six, one third, one third, one third. So I start there all alike. Suppose now German capitalists do something which the French and the British are not aware of. So this is private enterprise in the international market, and the German capitalists take a particular kind of strategic action, which is to raise the composition of their capital. This becomes 8 for them, and hence this number becomes 8, 10 is 12, and they produce not one, but they produce two products. And so if we add up what happens to the world market of shirts, 
This has become now 28. This has become 4. So the world, the price has fallen from 8, previous price, now to 7. So the new price in the world market, I'll put new here, is then 7 per shirt because the Germans have increased the supply of shirts by raising their, organic comp uh, raising their composition of capital. So Germany is becoming more cap in the language of economics. The Germans are employing the same labor, working the same hours, but with more capital. The index of mechanization has gone up. Whoops. So this is now 8 over 10. This is 0.8. And the productivity of German labor has gone up. And that's reflected in the world market, one market, by the price of a shirt falling from 8 to 7 because the productivity of labor has risen. And I'm assuming for the moment that the British and French don't do anything. They don't know about this. Well, there is a new revenue and there's a new cost. Because everybody comes to market and sells their shirts now no longer at 8. The new price is 7. It's a competitive market. So they sell for 7. The French sell for seven. The Germans sell two shirts. Seven plus seven is 14. Costs are six. Costs are 10. Costs are six. And hence the new profits as a result of this would be one, four, one. Well, let's look at this. Where are we? What, the question is, what does the world market, the global economy, do to those national capitals which have not innovated? And you can see from the, the whiteboard, what it does is kill the British and the French capitalists and expand the German capitalists. So the reward, the incentive to the German capitalists is they're getting two more let's use dollars because it's, e it's easy for me, they're getting two more dollars which they take away from the British and the French capitalists and the market redistributes that super profit, that two extra dollars to the Germans. And you can see what's going to happen. If this continues, then the British and the French capitalists in the textile industry are going to go out of business. They're going to go bankrupt. And historically, this is fascinating because the British were the first. They were the innovators. Now the newcomers, the Germans, are going to outcompete, drive out of business the British unless the British do something. And same with, 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 with the French. Okay. It's a very powerful story then of what's happening in this, in this world market. Uh, Lenin comes along later on, he's going to talk about what we just did here, and he's going to say, okay, a kind of imperialism is when these countries are competing with one another over super profit, <coughs> and that's, that competition can take a variety of different forms. Here I'm discussing it in terms of a loss of surplus on the part of, of Britain and France to the offensive uh, Germans. Now, you can this is in the 1850s to the, to the war, but we can easily change this. We could have today, um, I could put over here um, U.S., Japan, Europe, and this could be the auto industry starting in the 1970s. So you can, if, I, if I did this, you could see the offensive Japanese, the Honda, Toyota, and so forth, etc., would raise their composition of capital and take surplus away from the Europeans and the uh, Americans. And if it continued, the American and the European automobile industries would be driven out of business. You can extend this to the uh, computer industry today. Here you could put down uh, U.S. over here. You could put uh, the newcomer on the block, China, Japan. And as the Chinese raise their organic composition of capital, raise the productivity of labor in China, and so forth, et cetera, if, if that just continues, then the American and the Japanese, in this case, computer industries, would be driven out of business by the more efficient Japanese. So it's a powerful way of trying to explain what might happen as a result of global competition. Okay. Now. Let's not stop. Let's continue with this. What might then be some reactions to this 
on the part of the British and French uh, capitalists in, in, the, uh, in Britain, in UK, and in France, or the American uh, capitalists in the automobile industry, the European capitalists in the automobile industry over the last 35 years, or the American and Japanese uh, capitalists in the uh, computer industry or the high definition television industry uh, today. Okay, so let's just talk about some of the reactions uh, in order to, once again, to avoid being killed, going out of business. Okay, so let me erase this. First, to stay in business, to stay in business, and this is not an order of importance, that, so capitalists can do all of these. To stay in business, the capitalists have to work on, that is their subsumed class managers have to work on driving down average costs. Okay. We've talked about this. So the British capitalists in the cotton industry have to raise the productivity of labor in Britain. So this one is a increasing the productivity of labor. Where? In UK. To what? To to, to withstand the withering competition from the Germans. Americans, the American capitalists Detroit have to increase the productivity of labor in Detroit. Why? To withstand the competition from the Japanese. That's the denominator. The numerator, to reduce C and V. So it's not just one or the other. The capitalists in these affected industries are going to provide portions of their surplus, distribute them to the managers and perhaps even others to come up with all kinds of different corporate strategies to raise the productivity of labor in the denominator and, now you ready, search the world for cheap C and V. I want to come back to that. Okay. Secondly, you now have a reason for why a country or a state in a country might put on a tariff and or a quota. What, what does that do? Well, that's going to increase, that's going to make it more difficult for the Germans to compete in, uh, in England um, and or France. So it may be the case that the capitalists that are being affected, they may be doing all this, but they need, they, they, they go to the state and they say to the parliament or to U.S. Congress, look, it's going to take us a few years to raise the productivity of labor because we have to deploy new kinds of machines to do this and so forth. We're searching the world for cheap C and V, but that's going to take time. You know, searching the world for cheap V, that means we're going to put a plant someplace else um, with cheaper labor. In the meantime, give us a tariff. Give us um, a period of time to, in which you will protect us from the offensive uh, uh, capitalists so we can get our act together. And Congress and or, you know, case may be, c Congress or Parliament may, may do that. Or they may put a quota on the uh, foreign goods. So in the automobile industry, I can't remember exactly when this was, um, there was a quota on uh, Japanese cars being imported into the United States. So the, the, the Japanese manufacturers had a voluntary quota. The American president flew over there. They had an agreement in which the Japanese manufacturers put a, a quota on the amount of cars that they would export um, uh, to the United States, um, and hence the price of a Japanese car was higher than what it would be otherwise, and so to Detroit, for a period of time, was able to uh, compete until it could get its act together so it could compete with those Japanese products. Okay? Third, there can be an appeal to national labor to cut the real wage. So it's possible that uh, the capitalists, when they sit down with the workers, um, supported by the state and, and, and the media may say, look, in order for us to compete, you have to cut your real wage. Cut the V. The, cut the real wage part of V. Okay, So cut the V. So this is an appeal to domestic labor. I should have put that in. Domestic labor to cut their real wage, to reduce the V so we can compete on the international market. Okay? So it's not just a search the world for cheap C and perhaps put plants someplace else, but to appeal to domestic labor 
to decrease their, their real wage. Okay. What else? Well, all of these things may be working. It still may not be sufficient. It's possible that the struggle, the competitive struggle, could turn to war. War amongst the capitalists. In other words, the very struggle over super profit becomes so intense and so much is at stake in this that it's possible that war could be a result. And so Mr. Lenin connected this struggle over super profits to the emergence of war, World War I. And he tried to show that, no, no, he tried to show that there was an economic contribution to that war, war, a capitalist contribution, which is that the struggle over the super profits took the form of the Germans and the uh, French and the um, uh, British um, struggling with one another over the survival of these industries. Okay. I'll come back to that a little bit, but that's fascinating because it shows how capitalist competition, intense capitalist com competition, rivalry across these different national borders can be connected to an outbreak of a, of, of a major war. And I, let's again remember the first part of the course. We do not want to reduce war, international conflict amongst these nations to economics and you know, into this this, this competition over super profit. Um, people go to war for uh, many, many, many different reasons. But what this is suggesting on a, uh, uh, what Lenin is suggesting here is that there's an economic component to war then and, and today. That's the important lesson here. All right, I want to just, before I go on and talk about uh, how this works out, um, this, in, this global economy, I just want to go back and make sure uh, that we understand the importance of a cheapening of C and V. So I just want to go back for a moment and talk about the um, numerator here to make sure the, that, I, that this is clear. Um, and again, this will be a good review of what we've done here before. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to use the exact same numbers that we have been using here. I'm going to use UK, um, Germany, and France. And this is again C, V, and S. Okay, so um, I had here 4, 2, 2, um, 8, 2, 2, 4, 2, 2. This is the W, the total value was 8, this 12 is 8, the use values 1, 2, 1. All right, um, and let me put in, because it's useful to me, the revenues, the costs, and the profits. Okay, uh, the new price was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, 28, uh, 4, that was then 7, 14, 7, uh, 6, 10, 6, 1, 4, 1, and you know, that, that's the, the uh, problem, this new vector of profits is the problem for the British and the French and the success of the Germans. It's a redistribution of surplus. The market, the world market now, redistributes surplus away from the relatively inefficient French and British to the innovating Germans. Okay. Suppose in reaction to this, suppose in reaction to this, the British are able to cut real wages in Britain. Okay. So that's one reaction. Suppose this um, becomes one. Everything else stays the same, but suppose this becomes one. Okay. So this is a good review now. This then becomes three. And you could ask yourself, okay, why? You've got to answer that for this course and for the exams uh, that you're going to be, that you have taken already and that you will continue to take to finish the course. Why? Well, because, and I'll put it up here, the length of the workday has not changed. There's no, there's no change in absolute surplus value. There's no change in the number of laborers. By assumption, I'm assuming all that's changed. The living labor has not changed. It hasn't gone down, it hasn't gone up. Okay, so same length of workday, same number of, the, the little l is the same, the same number of people are being employed. The only change which has occurred is the division of the workday. This used to be the division V surplus. 
Now, the workers have been forced, or they accept, a lower real wage. A lower real wage, so the green, and hence the surplus grows. It grows to three, and this becomes one. It used to be two and two, now it becomes one and three. So there's a radical, radical change, if you want, in the distribution of income by the productive laborers. They now get a smaller portion of that which they produce. So the use value of labor power is the same. So the capitalists are getting now, okay, they're, they're getting that component of four, like they did before, two, two plus two, they're now getting one plus three. But they can pay the workers less for getting the same. The rate of exploitation has increased. So what does that mean? Well, that means over here, there's no change in the world price, as you can see. The eight is the same, four, five, there's no change here, there's no change in the quantities, so we still have seven, but now the costs for the British become five, and hence their profits now become two. So you can see here the recovery of the British from what it was before. So before they had one, now they have two. They've been able to withstand the offensive action um, by the Germans by raising the rate of exploitation in Britain. Nothing to do with now what's going on in France and Germany. Okay. That's a successful strategy. For, for, to summarize this, not only are the British workers exploited, but their exploitation rises because of this strategy in order to compensate the British capitalists for not being able to compete effectively with the Germans. That's a hell of a critique of capitalism. Okay? And how do you sell that to workers? I mean, because what I just said is outrageous. How do you sell that to, 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 to uh, British workers? Well, in a variety of ways. The state may say to them, and the media may say to them, or both may say to them, look, in order for us to, uh, in order for you to keep your jobs, uh, in order for this uh, uh, textile industry not to go out of business, we all have to pull together. Um, kind of in the spirit of uh, nationalism, we all have to get together, capitalist workers and state and so forth, etc. And you, your part in this will be to cut your uh, uh, wages and the part of the capitalist will be to be innovate and so forth, etc. Notice what that does. That pays absolutely no attention whatsoever to exploitation. It pays no attention whatsoever to the source of surplus and the inability of the British capitalists to maintain their surplus because of the offensive action of the Germans. Let me give you the second example now, okay? So uh, I want to get the same tableau on, on the blackboard, so I don't want to change the numbers too dramatically. So let me go back to 2-2. Two, two. Okay. And let me change this now to what it was. All right. Suppose the, the, the uh, uh, just get rid of this here. This is 6, 4 plus 2. So I'm going back to what I had. Suppose instead of a, a cut in the real wages, suppose the British are successful in cheapening their C. Okay? Suppose they're able to cut this to 2. Okay? For example, uh, uh, textile, cotton shirts are produced with the raw material cotton, and suppose somehow, and I'm going to come to the moment, that somehow the British are able to get cheaper cotton from, say, Egypt, or say, from India. Okay? And since cheaper cotton translates into a cheaper C. So let's do this one for the moment. So this now becomes 6, 2, 4, 6, still producing 1. The only thing that's changed here is that the cotton has become cheaper. So this now is uh, 26 of total value divided by 4. Huh, that's 6.5, okay? And so the revenues now become 6.5, 6. Po sorry, uh, 
13, because there's two shirts by the Germans, 6.5, and the costs then become 4, because they've been able to cut their C, 10, 6, and hence the new profits would be 2.53 and 0.5. So again, just focusing on the British, that's a recovery of the British from what it was. That is, before they took an offensive action, they were being clobbered. This was one. Now they're able to recover and fight the, they have an opportunity to fight the Germans because they've been able to cheapen the sea. Well, you know, put that together. The British, and by extension, every other country, including the Germans, the British have an interest in developing cheap C and V all over the world. And so Marx and Marxists after Marx, when he, after he died, f began to focus on and analyze the global economy as one way to get cheapened C and V goods all over the world, enabling those uh, capitalist countries to survive and prosper. So let me turn to that then, that, that examination. So let me get this tableau away. And I give it, I've, we've given the motivation now for two things. Okay, let me get that on the blackboard. C plus V divided by UV. So it, this is in UK now. In UK, the British are continually trying to raise the productivity of labor in Britain by raising the, organic, uh, the composition of capital there, the C over C plus V. They are searching the world for cheap C and cheap V, and they're also putting pressure on the workers to reduce their real wage. What I mean by that is, I understand there's a lot here, but we've done a lot on this course. In, in UK, British capitalists are searching the world for cheap V goods, but they're also putting downward pressure on the real wage, which is the one I just did, cutting that real wage from two to one. Okay? So there's two things going on here in conjunction. Search the world for cheap wage goods, T. Search, okay, that's this component. Search the world for cheap C goods. Also put pressure on the workers to cut their real wage. And these are not substitutes, they can go together. And raise the productivity of the laborers in Britain. All of this to drive down average cost in UK so the British can compete. Okay, so let me turn to this now. Okay, I want to go back and I want, I want to go talk about this and then I'll extend it to, to, to the cheapening of V. So I want to talk about how does Britain actually accomplish this? How did this happen? How does it still happen? So let's look at the C. For Marx, the C has two components. Okay, it has the exchange value per unit use value of what he calls circulating capital plus the exchange value per unit use value of fixed capital. If I remember correctly, we did this once before, okay, in this course. So the C has these two components. Your fixed capital refers to the value of your machines, the, the price of the machine times the number of machines. So if a machine costs $1,000, that would be here, but note, if the machine costs 1000 and it lasts for 10 years, then in one year we only use up one-tenth of the machine. So the economists and the accountants and the engineers call this a depreciation rate. So in this case, only $100, one-tenth of a thousand, would be written off as the amount of the machines used up. The circulating capital, that's assumed to be used up in that same production period. So this would be all the raw materials necessary to produce uh, cotton shirts. So this would be the raw cotton. These would be the machines in England to uh, uh, produce the shirts, okay? Suppose it were the case, which is the case, that England doesn't produce raw cotton, which you need to produce uh, cotton shirts, where? In England. So they do have the machines in England. That's produced and sold in England. That's the department one industry. But unfortunately for the British, the raw cotton is produced someplace else. 
let's say it's produced in India, a colony of Britain. Okay, so what Britain wants a cheap C. Okay, so yes, it, it's important to have cheaper the cheapening of, of fixed capital machines. We already discussed that. That's the competition in the machine good industry. That's occurring. That's good for the industry that's buying those machines. But it also wants cheaper cotton. Because both of these will drive down C and allow the average cost in the textile industry in Britain to fall so that they can compete with the French and the Germans. So how, do the, in, how does the Britain accomplish this, this part of its cost? Okay. Cotton is produced in India. If I take this price of cotton, Let's, uh, let me just write, write it down here, raw cotton, the raw material. I have then the use value over the C plus V plus surplus. Where? In India. We started, this is Britain. We have now moved to India. These things are connected by what? The world economy. So in India, if the British can increase the productivity of labor, increase the productivity of labor where? In India. Simultaneously decrease the cost of producing raw cotton where? In India. They're able to drive this down, reduce the C, and to make a long story short, increase the rate of profit where? In UK. That's really quite dramatic. Okay. So Marx in volume three of Capital begins to discuss how the world economy and let's add to it now colonialism and imperialism, in this case British colonialism in India, can be a way to offset the, the declining rate of profit in Britain by producing cheap C and let's just extend it cheap V goods as well. It's quite, really quite dramatic. Now, let's turn to the right-hand side. How, how might this be accomplished? Well, rising the productivity of labor, that's part of colonial policy. Let's just take simple stuff. Let's summarize what we've done here. One, to raise the productivity of labor in India, you raise the composition of capital in India. We've done that. Increase the capital labor ratio in India, enables a rise in the productivity of labor there, cheapens raw cotton, enhances the rate of profit in UK. Okay? Number two, invest in social overhead capital. Where? In India. Investing, the state in India should invest in social overhead capital. Uh, uh, road systems, harbors, and so forth, etc., enabling that productivity of labor to, to, to rise, cheapening the price of cotton, enhancing the rate of profit in UK. Let's not forget the rate of profit in UK here. So what I'm doing here is dropping this and pushing up the rate of profit by cheapening circulating capital. Okay. It, it, let me take a moment on this because this is so much history here. Suppose it were the case in this tropical country that the longer people worked in the fields, H, the longer people worked in the fields, um, the more susceptible they were to tropical diseases. So one of the things the British might do to, to, to enable people to work the hours in the fields and to get more people to work in the fields would be to invest in health facilities because health facilities would allow people to, to withstand these tropical diseases, work longer hours and have more of them doing that, and hence you'd be able to have a numerator. So I'm not talking about that the productivity necessarily grows, but if the, if the H is very small, to make this dramatic, if the L is zero, you're not going to get any productivity of labor. So you have to have people alive and working long hours in order to get an output. So investment in health facilities matters. Education matters. So the British, it's not just that the rise in the composition of capital in, in uh, uh, India, but also this investment in all kinds of social overhead capital with, of education, health, 
um, research and development in the production of cotton, new technologies, all of this to raise the productivity of labor. Along with that is to decrease C. Now notice this. This is the C that's being deployed in India. So let me just examine that. This is in India, circulating, circulating capital plus fixed capital in India. Let me focus on this, right, this one here. The C may be falling in India because this component, the fixed capital, is falling. What does that mean? Well, to produce cotton in India, the Indian cultivators, whoever they might be, might be purchasing cheaper fixed capital, deploying it in the cultivation of cotton, machines and tools and tech technolo new technologies embodied in the machines and tools, which enables the seed to fall, which raises the rate of profit in, in the UK. The, why might this be falling? Well, because of the struggle over super profits. So after the 1850s, there is intense competition in the means of production industry throughout the West. And in this case, in England, the rate of profit is falling there, and the unit value of these machines, fixed capital, is falling. They become the exports from Britain to India, deployed in Indian cultivation of raw cotton, drives down the sea there, along with the rise in the productivity of labor of, of uh, workers in India, cheapens raw cotton, enhances the, the rate of profit in Britain. So, I mean, putting it, if you put it all together, the declining rate of profit in UK from intense competition with, within Britain and then with the uh, Germans and so forth, etc., creates an opportunity to raise the rate of profit in Britain. And this link here is the world economy. And you can just extend which, what we just did to V goods as well. It's not just the C goods. Which is in which this is occurring. And the last step, because I don't want to lose what we've done in the first part of the course. In India, what we just discussed here in India, or let me, do, let me extend it actually, across the world can be done on a variety of different class structures. This CVS surplus value, to go back to the first part of the course, that can be done under different class structures. So for example, you could have the feudal during this period of time in India. So this could be a feudal arrangement, and the feudal unit values would be falling, which would enhance capitalism in Britain. It could be done under the ancient class structure. So this would be India, a kind of sharecropping arrangement in the ancient in Uganda, in Africa, at that point in time. It could be the slave in the United, in the United States South, prior to the 1860s, okay? And of course, capitalism too. In other words, we can have these different class structures in which all of this is occurring. This doesn't necessarily have to be capitalism across the third world. Let me now summarize, if I can, this, this uh, uh, interesting, I hope, interesting story about uh, the world economy. Let me erase this board to get our summary on it. OK. In Britain, we have the following. During this period of time, or act during any period of time, makes no difference, we have a struggle, a competitive struggle in capitalism, a rise in the composition of capital, a rise in C over C plus V. Okay? Those long and uh, eloquent passages in capital on mechanization, cooperation, division of labor, managers as an orchestra leader, the really quite uh, striking uh, description that Marx provides in volume one over something like two, three hundred pages of a rise in the, comp the mechanization, the rise in the composition of capital, um, and how uh, uh, capitalism is increasing the productivity of labor. And I want to emphasize it need not only be by this, it can be by lambda as well. 
okay, different management strategies, different incentives, and so forth, etc., can serve to increase the productivity of labor. This rise in the composition of capital tends to drive down the rate of profit. Where? In Britain. So the focus in the sea industry, well, let me do it here. Rise in the composition of capital in the sea industry, in the sea industry, sea industry, a fall in the rate of profit in the sea industry as a result of this competitive struggle, but also a fall in the unit value of machines. Okay, fixed capital in this industry. Okay, both. And it's not just one. They're, these are two sides of the same story. So we have the possibility of recession in Britain because the rate of profit is being driven down by intense competition within British capitalism and across different capitalist nations. So uh, Lenin describes both of these that, that are occurring. Okay. This fall in fixed capital enables Britain to do what? To export cheap and capital goods to India. So here is our, this link here, this is our world economy. Here's our national economy, UK national economy. So Britain begins to export cheapened capital goods as a result of intense competition within Britain and across Europe. The cheapened capital goods, in turn, these are the imports in the numerator. These are the imports, the fixed capital, in the production of raw cotton, the raw material, in where? In India thousands of miles away. So this becomes cheapened. At the same time, this is going up. And if you're just wondering in the blackboard, just to review what we've done, if V falls as well, there's no effect on the total ratio because a fall in V is a rise in surplus value. Okay, so the price, the total price of the raw cotton, raw cotton, the raw material, does not change if there's a fall in V because that's, a, that's just like a fall in V is an increase in the S over V. It's the fall in the C that pushes this down and an increase in the, the productivity of labor in India. So, it, okay. so the export of cheapened capital goods is production of raw material and cotton becomes cheapened because of a fall in the import price, right? The import price of fixed capital in, in India. That in turn then drops the price of the raw material. That feeds back to push this up. And we have then the world economy on this side be, why? Because the British are purchasing the cheaper raw material, which enables the profit rate to rise in Britain. And you know, to go back to what we did, okay, this is the machine. We started out with a falling rate of profit in the uh, uh, capital good in the, uh, industry in Britain. Okay, so why does it rise? Because of relative surplus value. Because the capital good industry in Britain is purchasing labor power, and the labor power in Britain is becoming cheapened because an important component of the means of production, which is clothing, is becoming cheapened. So here in Britain, we have the value of labor power equal to the exchange value, use value of the V goods, cotton cloth, times the UV cotton cloth. And so this is falling 
which is helping the British capital good industry, because I mean, they're not producing cotton shirts, they're producing capital goods, but they are a buyer of labor power, like all capitalists are, are and the value of labor power is cheapen, is becoming cheaper to them because of what's happening in India, what's happening in India. Okay? If you couple that with the attempts of the British, perhaps also to decrease the real wage, you have then a strong argument of why the rate of exploitation is rising in Britain during this period of time, pushing up the rate of profit. Okay, so the world economy becomes a way to, to, to connect these different capitals competing with one another. And what I just did for the, um, the uh, 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 C good could be done for V goods as well, because it's not just raw cotton, but it's also all kinds of tea and coffee and sugar and meat and grains and tobacco and, of course, cocoa. All those important uh, 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 V goods are being produced in the third world. They're all becoming cheapened by the same process, right? Raising the productivity of labor and the cultivation of the V goods all over the world. Reduced Z is an input into the production of the teas and coffees and so forth, etc. Cheapening the unit values now just of, of, uh, of, of not the, uh, the C component, but now the V goods feeds back to raise the rate of ex exploitation, relative surplus value, which pushes up the rate of profit in all the different industries in Britain. Okay, So let me conclude this story on imperialism. Uh, the capitalist economy in Europe and the US today and Japan and so forth is pushed to the, always to reduce the average cost in each and every by in each and every firm in each and every industry in order to survive that's what competition is all about number one number two as a result of that the Europeans the Americans the Japanese the Germans and so forth they search the world for cheap C and V as well as attempts to raise the productivity of labor within their home countries. To go back in time, after the 1850s, specifically around the eight, from the 1870s onward, the European capitalists tried to carve up the world into their different private places of production of C and V goods and their private markets for their output. In other words, they tried to create an empires associated with these different national uh, uh, countries. Why? To get a place, one of the reasons for that was to get a place in which they could produce the cheap C and V, as you just saw, to enhance the rate of profit in their countries because they were competing so severely with one another, but also so that they could have a secure market for their exports. You know, you know it, it, it may be obvious to you, but let me just put it down anyway. For these countries, in Britain, what they're doing is not just producing for a domestic product, but they're also producing for a foreign market. And it's, if they can r increase their exports to India, their massive surplus rises. So the British are interested in, in selling their goods any place, because in that way they can realize more surplus. So it's not just cheap C and cheap V, but it's also an expansion of their markets. In other words, to expand their exports, their sales of these goods abroad. So the capitalists then compete in a variety of ways. They compete uh, by attempting to raise the productivity of labor in their countries by raising the composition of capital within their countries. They compete by tariffs. They compete by quotas. And during this period of time, they also competed by carving up the world into their private spheres of production of cheap CV and markets, and excluding, obviously, the other capitalists um, from entering those uh, private spheres. And as a result of this, as I mentioned to you before, you could get war. So the British and the Germans could begin to uh, go to war, not only in Europe, but in Africa over, over, over cotton. The British and the uh, 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 Germans could begin to compete um, in Latin America over the sale of, uh, of cheap textiles, the British attempting to prevent the Germans from selling their cheap textiles in, in uh, various countries in Latin America during this period of time. And out of this could come this, this uh, you know, this, this broader war. 
during this period of time, World War I, okay, a, a, a famous Marxist, um, her name was Rosa Luxemburg, um, L-U-X-E-M-B-U-R-G. Uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg was a, uh, born in Poland, a Polish. Um, she emigrated to uh, Germany. Um, she settled in Germany for the rest of her life. Um, and she was a, one of the most uh, well-known and eloquent uh, debaters uh, of, of Marxism in her time. During the war, she came up with the following kind of argument, which I think follows from what we did today. She said, World War I represents in part a struggle of capitalists over super profits. She said it's not a fight of the class of productive laborers, whether they be Germans or, or French or British. Rather, it's a struggle amongst capitalists via the struggle, the scramble for super profit, as I, as I tried to show you. Her conclusion was that the British workers should not be fighting the German workers. The French workers should not be fighting the German workers because it wasn't their war. It was the, it was the war of the capitalists located in these different countries that were struggling with one another. And the, the army was mostly manned by uh, soldiers who came from the working class. Uh, rather from the capitalist class. So hence, why should the workers fight in a war that had nothing to do with them? That was really a different and striking argument. That was extraordinarily dangerous, of course, um, for these countries uh, uh, to continue the war. And so Rosa Luxemburg was de dealt with rather harshly by the German authorities, um, since she was undermining the war effort there in her theoretic her Marxist uh, analysis of World War I, so they locked her up, they threw her in jail, and unfortunately um, she was assassinated not too long um, after that. I don't remember the date, but just after, I think, World War I. So don't ever think um, in your, your studies from this course or any other course that theories do not matter because you have a striking example here, and I've given you other examples when we discussed epistemology of how theory matters, and in this particular case, how this Marxian theory gave a completely different insight into World War I, and you can extend this throughout the 20th century into the current wars today. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.